Shabbat Shalom, everyone. I'm Monty Judah with Lion of Lamb Ministries. Welcome to our program. We are right now, we are in a, a series of teachings about messianic teachings for Christians. This is specifically targeted to speak to our Christian brethren, our church uh, brethren, and to point out some of the differences uh, that a messianic believes as a verse to a Christian that goes to Sunday church. And we're doing so in, in the hope and of love of expressing to you what we think is a more perfect way of understanding the Messiah. In the first set, uh, the, we addressed the specific topic of what the Messiah said concerning the law and the prophets. And he specifically said that he came to fulfill the law and the prophets, not to abolish them. And he went through a whole series of arguments to express why you should not think that any part of the law of Moses or any part of the prophets has been annulled, set aside, changed, modified, or whatever. And, and we tried to, in that program, that first set, <clears throat> to illustrate for you the very specific statements that the Messiah has made, how the apostles echoed exactly those same statements, and showed how that the church and the church fathers have literally turned that around and have taught that he came to do away with certain things of the law, to set aside the customs of Moses and so forth. That is not what the Messiah said. And so that's a fundamental point in trying to understand where's the Messianic coming from. Now, this next set, we're going to move into another area of that is the, one of the differences of, between Messianics and those that are Christian church that go to church. And that has to do with the subject of covenants. Now, my Bible... Um, is a traditional English Bible, and uh, like your Bible, and if you look at the front part of the Bible, it's going to say it's the Old Covenant or the Old Testament, and if you look from Matthew on, it'll say the New Testament. And in fact, there's going to be a page that's going to be just before the book of Matthew that's actually a title page in almost every Bible, and it says New Testament. And by the very fact that they say New Testament, it infers, oh, there's an Old Testament. There's the one before. And the average Christian thinks there's just two covenants. And that's the way it's taught. The Bible in churches is taught there's two covenants. There's an Old Covenant and a New Covenant. And the very word new seems to infer that there's an Old uh, most of us in um, our world here in America, you know, we are uh, we're very familiar with an expression called it's brand new. And when it's brand new, it's like so much better that it replaces the other. You know, it, and that's our culture. That's the way we communicate. And part of that culture that we have lends itself to the understanding, the Christian understanding about the old and new covenants very simple for to do it. And furthermore, uh, we also take it to the point of the Greek level of definition of testament. As you know, many Christian scholars, they focus in on the Greek uh, as the ancient language because the New Testament, most of it was written in Greek. And so they emphasize the, the words in the Greek meaning. And when it comes to the word testament, in the Greek, there are two definitions for the word uh, testament. Uh, one of them is it's an agreement, and that's the same thing as the Hebrew definition for it. But there's a secondary definition, and it's the same one that we use when we're referring to a last will and testament. And a last will and testament, which is the secondary definition in the Greek, it means this is a, like for example, I have a will that I've written out for my family. It's my final wishes. Should I pass? These are the things that I'm instructing and asking to be done. And so what the Greek and the Christians have done is they've taken that definition 
and applied it to the New Testament and said, well, this is uh, the Messiah's last will and testament, and these are his final things, and that means that every other agreement before is, is set aside because we have the last will and testament, you know, here of God. And this is the definition that is used in Christian teaching. That is not the definition that's used in the Hebrew. And by the way, this is a Hebrew Bible. This is written in Eastern logic, not Western logic. This is about the Hebrew people, the Hebrew Messiah, the Hebrew apostles, the nation of Israel. It's all in Hebrew logic and culture. And the words that are used in this book are using the Hebrew definition. Let me give you a case in point, an example of kind of what I'm talking about. I remember when I was a youth um, that the word gay simply meant you were happy. You know, this is, this is what you did when you had your birthday party. You were gay. However, as time has gone on in this generation, the homosexual community has decided to adapt that word to express their point of view. And so now the word gay uh, is referring to the homosexual uh, lesbian community. And people don't go around, normal people don't go around, regular people, I should say, don't go around using the word gay. We don't say, oh, well, he's gay, because that, that, there's a connotation that says, no, that, that's what that means. So let me give you an example of what I'm talking about when it comes to the Hebrew versus the Greek way of thinking. Let's say that I had a friend, and he lived in some South Pacific island. And it's a paradise there. I mean, it's absolutely wonderful. You know, they've got uh, they've got uh, mai tais on the drink and umbrella drinks, and they're all out at the beach, and they're all getting a good suntan, and everybody has fun there. And he writes me a letter, and he says, "Hey, the whole place, we are gay." Now he was communicating to me, they're all happy. You know, they love the mai tais, they love the beach, you know, the whole bit, and they're gay. But now I've gotten the letter from them, and so I'm now explaining <clears throat> my friend who's out on this tropical island having a good time, and I explain it to some other people here with me, and I say, yeah, they're all homosexuals because of the word gay. Am I being accurate? Am I really representing my friend that's there on the tropical island correctly? No. No, I'm not. You see, I changed the meaning of the same word, and I made it mean something else. It, in English, this is what we call the difference between a denotation and a connotation. A connotation has the emotional overtones. The denotation is just the definition of the word. The word gay, the denotation, means to be happy. The connotation is to be a homosexual. Well, vastly different in the definitions. If I take these Hebrew words and Hebrew expressions and I lay a Greek definition on top of the same word, but I lay a Greek definition on top of it, have I <clears throat> accurately taught you what the Scripture says? The answer is no, I have not. I'm sure that you've heard other people arguing about inter proper interpretation, they said, oh, <clears throat> it has to be in context. I agree. It has to be in the context. This is a Hebrew context. The definitions for the words are Hebrew words. We have to use the Hebrew definitions for them. So right off the bat, let's talk about the word new. New in Hebrew does not mean that it replaces anything. New means that something is refreshed or renewed. It doesn't change it. Let me give you an example. The Bible is filled of an instruction called the new moon. And when we have the cycle of the noon and it comes around to the, the new cycle, we call it the new moon. 
God does not go out into the universe, pluck out that rock that's orbiting around the earth, throw it away, and put a new one there. He doesn't make the moon go away. It's the same moon. But because of the cycle, we call it new. And illustrating that even further, Greek thinking is what we call, Greek logic is what we call linear you have point A here, and you have point B here, okay? It's linear. You go from A to B. That is not Hebrew thought. Hebrew thought and Hebrew logic, Eastern logic, is cyclic. Here's point A, and here's point B. Here's point C. Here's point D. In other words, the process is taking you through the process not a line or linear. The Sabbath, the Sabbath is the same Sabbath it's always been. It's just renewed every seven days. The months, they're renewed. The years, they're renewed. It's, you know, we say it's the new year. Well, we all know it's still the same earth and we're still here. It's just, it's been refreshed. That's the Hebrew definition. So when the prophet Jeremiah spoke of a new covenant. In no wise is that word in Hebrew meaning it replaces anything. It means it's a renewing of something that's taking place. Uh, let's go back and cover a couple other key points. <clears throat> Anyone who says there's two covenants in the Bible flat does not know the Bible. The fact of the matter is, there are seven covenants explained in the Bible. Let me review them with you. God made a covenant with Adam first. And then afterwards, he made a covenant with Noah. And then he made a covenant with Abraham and the fathers. Then he made a covenant with Moses and the children of Israel. Then he made a covenant with King David. Then he brought the Messiah and he made the new covenant. And by the way, there's a future covenant that's been prophesied to come. It's called the covenant of peace. It's the one the Messiah will establish when we're in the kingdom. By saying the term, there's two covenants, you have completely missed the teaching of the scriptures. The scriptures are based on seven covenants. God has been consistently manifesting himself to us throughout the ages with all the different stories. We need to know the whole story, beginning all the way back with Adam, to understand how God has been manifesting himself to us. And by simply taking all of that previous stuff before the Messiah and just lumping it into a basket and say, oh, that's old, we don't need to know about that, you have made an unbelievable huge mistake in terms of your learning your faith and understanding what the Messiah really came to do. Now, here's the other amazing thing about that. At no time has any follow-on covenant ever replaced or changed the previous covenant. So when God made the covenant, for example, with Adam, and he said, Adam, uh, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to kick you out of the garden, and here's now what you're going to be facing. Your wife is going to bear children in a travail, and you're going to labor by the sweat of your brow. It's going to be labor for you to live. <clears throat> when Noah made a covenant with God, and he was promised that God would not judge the world by water again, and he put the rainbow in the sky for them to see it, uh, that in no wise changed how birthing takes place for mankind. It did not change the, 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 the sweat of the brow for the labor that had been done with Adam. Those things are still intact. And then later, when God made a covenant with Abraham, and he said that he would make his descendants as the stars of the heaven, just because he's looking up the heaven, he didn't make the rainbow go away. And the rainbow still means the same thing that it did from the covenant of Noah. And the same thing is with Moses and the children of Israel. When God made the covenant with them, 
that did not replace other things. In fact, it adapted and used the same things. For example, the law in the Ten Commandments, when it talks about Sabbath, it says, remember to keep the Sabbath holy. The instructions about Sabbath were way back with Adam. Adam was told that the world was created in six days and God rested on the seventh. And, and that was understood by Adam and Noah and they had done it. And so when it came to Moses, all he was doing was reiterating what was already understood before and saying, remember to keep it and so forth. You remember Noah, when he got done with the flood, that he uh, did some sacrifices to God? You know what the scripture says? It says he sacrificed clean animals. Did you know that Adam and Noah already understood the difference between clean and unclean animals that the law talks about? Those were things that were always before that. In fact, the testimony of Abraham was that he kept all of the commandments of the Lord. Even before the law had been given, Abraham was a righteous man and was doing the right things before God. He was a righteous man for it. Now, when King David came along and the covenant was made with him that there would never be a lack of a man to be on his throne, namely that the son of David would be the Messiah king forever on that throne, that didn't do away with the law. That didn't do away with any of the provisions of the law uh, whatsoever. So when the Messiah comes, guess what he says? Completely consistent with what had been said before, he said, I came to fulfill the law, not to abolish it. If you just go back and look at the original agreements God has made with mankind that are still with us to this day, God has never before gone back and changed and modified any of that. And by the way, I have news for you, brethren. The new covenant is going to make it all the way into the kingdom. When we get to the kingdom, the new covenant's not going to be modified or changed. It's going to be the same one. I'm going to show you the prophecy on that to illustrate that even more. <clears throat> now, here's an interesting thing that the new covenant did really do for us as compared to the other covenants. And this is one of the arguments about why it's a better covenant. I agree, it is. It's that the new covenant is a personal covenant between God and us individually. If you go back and you look at the earlier covenants, God made a covenant with Adam that was for all of mankind. When God made a covenant with Noah, it was for all of mankind. When you look at Abraham, God made a covenant with him and his family that would result in the nation of Israel. He made a covenant with the nation of Israel, with Moses and all those that were believing in the God of Israel. He made a covenant with them. The idea was that from the very beginning with Abraham, that in his seed, Abraham, all the families of the earth would be blessed. And Israel was brought forth as a nation to what? Be a light to the nations. God is purposing to reach out to the world through the auspices of Abraham's call and the nation of Israel being formed. It's not exclusive to them. It's God's plan of dealing with all the families of the earth. Where did we get the idea that that was a covenant exclusively for Israel, and now we got to set up one for the rest of the world? God has been working with the rest of the world the whole time. And that's a misunderstanding of the covenant that God made with Moses and the children of Israel. The uh, Hebrew agreement that we have, the word Brit, and in fact in the Hebrew, the New Testament or New Covenant is referred to the Brit Hadashah. Brit means cutting. When you make a Brit, you cut a deal. Did you hear that? You cut a deal. That's where we get that expression from. It's a Brit. And <clears throat> when we have a Brit, a circumcision of a son on the eighth day, he's entering into the agreement that God made with Abraham. That's the agreement we're entering into. We're agreeing with that. And all those of Israel are to be a part of it. 
If you go back and you look at the previous covenants, there was always a cutting and a shedding of blood with every covenant that God made. When Adam got removed from the garden, God slew two animals, took their skins, and made them a covering for Adam and Eve. There was a cutting. Noah sacrificed those clean animals. There was a cutting. When Abraham set up altars and and on and sacrifice to, to God for it, Moses, all kinds of sacrifices, the whole temple system, the whole sacrificial system was set up. David, the same thing, when he established the city of Jerusalem and built the first altar there. Yeshua, he literally gave his own life. He was pierced. He, his own body became the covenant you know, for us. This is the way the Hebrews define an agreement, a brit. That is not the Greek definition. The Greek definition, again, goes back to the last will and testament kind of concept that they have. The, uh, again, let me tell you that the covenants that God has spoken to, we are in the process right now of the new covenant, but we have the benefit of all the previous covenants. There's still another covenant to come, the covenant of peace that is still to come. I want to um, take you to, because the new covenant is the focal point for the Christian world, this is what they hang their hat on, and they try to explain that as um, their whole definition for the two covenants. Let's go to the actual prophecy. Jeremiah 31 is where we find the prophecy in the new covenant. This is the specific one that is quoted in the book of Hebrews. This is the specific one that the Messiah kept referring to. So Jeremiah 31, beginning at verse, um, let me... Um, missing a page, so let's go directly to my Bible. Jeremiah 31, beginning at verse 31, here's what he says. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Who did he make this new covenant with? Behold, the days are coming when I will make a new covenant with the Gentile church. It didn't say that. It said, I'm going to make it with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Now, at the time that Jeremiah spoke this, the nation of Israel had been split into two kingdoms. There was a northern kingdom, which was called the house of Israel. There was a southern kingdom called the house of Judah. And they had different kings, and they had different prophets at various times. But this new covenant that's being prophesied is for both of those. And he sees Israel as a whole you know, for it. Um, so anybody who says to you, well, the new covenant was given so that we establish the church. That is a false statement. You have changed the words of what Jeremiah said. Jeremiah said it was intended to Israel, not anybody else. Let's go further. Not like a covenant which I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant which they broke, although I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. Now he's making reference to the children of Israel when they came out of Egypt. So let's talk about that for just a moment. What is he really saying? He's talking about that the children of Israel came out of Egypt as a result of the Passover that the lamb was slain, it covered them, they were passed from death to life, and then God led them out of Egypt, out of the land of Egypt, and he established a covenant with them. And if you recall, he took them to Mount Sinai. Moses went up on the mountain, uh, came back down. God spoke the Ten Commandments. Moses goes back up. He brings the tablets back. You remember what the children of Israel did? they got impatient waiting on Moses to come down with the tablets. And they set up an idol. They, from the very beginning, they, they broke the covenant. 
that covenant that God made there are like marriage vows. In fact, a covenant of marriage is made by vows. God makes covenants like marriage vows. And he pictured himself, I made this agreement with Israel, I would be their husband, they would be my bride. I'm sure you've heard the expression, the church is the bride of the Messiah. Well, that first relationship was set up between God and Israel. Did you hear me? The bride of the Messiah, the bride of God, is Israel. And he's speaking here about the new covenant. And he says, remember, I became an Israel. I became a husband to them. I made this vow uh, to them, but they, they broke it. Now, before we go any further, I have heard certain Christian teachers say, well, those covenants are conditional, that uh, God rejected Israel, cast off Israel because they broke the covenant. That's a person that doesn't really know the Lord. And that's a person that has not paid attention to what God be did from the very beginning with Abraham. I can show you scripture after scripture after scripture that it says God keeps his covenants. When Abraham first set up the covenant with God, he was instructed to take five sacrifices, flay them open, leave them there, and uh, to wait for the Lord. The Lord put him to sleep, but he was able to see in a visionary way what God did. God came as a whirling, fiery tornado. He walked right down through these filleted sacrifices. Now, what does that mean? What, what, kind of, what, what is the ancient understanding of that agreement? That means that God walked down through the sacrifice and said, if I don't keep this covenant, may I be flayed open like these sacrifices. I mean, he's putting upon him a punishment that says, if I don't keep this, may I be flayed open. Now, if you go back and you can recount the story again, if you want, Abraham never walked through those sacrifices. But Abraham has that covenant. And essentially what is understood that was established there is God said, I'm going to keep this covenant, and if I don't do it, then may I be flayed open. He also says, and I'm also keeping the one for you, Abraham. If you don't keep it, may I be flayed open, because he's the only one that walked down through there. Now do you understand why the Messiah had to come and lose his life for us? Because we're in the business of breaking covenants with God, and somebody's got to pay the price. And God committed to us, I'm going to keep both parts of the covenant. Now, the people that go around saying, well, covenants are conditional, Israel was cut off, and so forth, they don't know God. And they don't know the covenant that God makes with mankind. He says, I keep the covenant. We're only here by the grace of God, by the good favor of God. We have no righteousness to commend us. And oh, by the way, I think you can all agree with me about this. There's no way any of us can keep the covenant anyways. We're all sinners. We're all worthy of the punishment. The law is righteous. We all transgress the law. We're all sinners. And the scripture clearly teaches that. But the difference is that God has done something for us. He's made a sacrifice for us. He's the sacrifice that comes from God, the Lamb of God's sacrifice. And that's what pays the penalty for everything to remain righteous and just before God and how we are delivered from it. Let me read uh, further for you. Verse 33. But this is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law in their inward parts and in their heart I will write it. And I will be their God and they will be my people. He took the commandments that God had given at Mount Sinai that were put on tablets of stone, and he wrote them on the tablets of our heart. That is what the Messiah did for us. The tablets go in the temple. And in here is the temple of God with the tablets, and those commandments are written there. Did he 
change any of the commandments? No. They are the same commandments that were given there. And the only comparison that's made for the new covenant is not new commandments. Rather, there is a new place for the commandments to be written, not on tablets of stone, now on the tablets of our heart. This new covenant has become very personal to us. The other covenants were dealing with all of mankind. This one is a better covenant. God deals and makes a covenant with us personally. And those commandments are written on our heart. So we each individually have them. No change in the commandments. Now, you're probably wondering about, well, didn't God give us a new commandment? Let me briefly answer that for you. John, in his letter, says it's really not a new commandment. It's really an old commandment called love your neighbor. But since we haven't been doing it, the Messiah's instruction, it's almost like a new commandment for us because we're not doing it. I humorously refer to a lot of Messianics when they come into this and they begin to turn back to Moses and learn. I always say this expression, if, if the Old Testament has suddenly become new to you and the New Testament has become old to you, then you probably are messianic. You're going back and learning old things, but they're new to you. And Yeshua came teaching the disciples to love one another because, quite honestly, they hadn't been doing it. And so it was like a new commandment for them. And that's where that expression comes from. That's what that's about. No new commandments. They're all the same commandments in the new covenant. Verse 34, And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor, and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they will all know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them, says the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and their sin, I will remember no more. Now there's two very interesting statements there. One, our sins have been forgiven, and God doesn't remember them anymore. Praise God. Wonderful. But oh, by the way, not every man on this earth yet knows the Lord. And this new covenant will continue to extend all the way into the kingdom so that all men will know the Lord. Verse 35, thus says the Lord, who gives the sun for a light by day and the ordinances of the moon and the stars for a light by night, who stirs up the sea so that the waves roar thereof. The Lord of hosts is his name. That's an introduction by the way, God is getting ready to make a very powerful announcement. He's reminding you who he is. So what is the announcement? Verse 36. If these ordinances, if this law departs from me, says the Lord, then the seed of Israel shall also cease from being a nation before me. What? He just said in the New Covenant, the law is never going to cease. By the way, just for the record, Israel still exists and is still in this world and will continue to exist. Where did we get the idea that the New Covenant did away with the other covenants? That was the teaching of men. That is not what this prophecy says. That is not what Yeshua taught. That is not what is taught in, in the New Covenant. <clears throat> Verse 37, thus says the Lord, if heaven can be measured and the foundations of the earth searched out beneath, then I will also cast off all of the seed of Israel for all the day that they have done, says the Lord. What? How big is the universe? Tell me what is on the inside of the earth. Well, we live in the modern age where we've got these big space telescopes and they are trying to understand how big the universe is. Right now they think it's like 90 billion light years big. Do they know for sure? No. They're just guessing. They're admitting they don't really know, but they're trying to, trying to understand it. And what is down inside the earth? Well, we think it's kind of a core, iron core thing. Well, you know, they just discovered that there's an ocean 
underneath the surface of the earth that's bigger than the ocean that's on the earth. Wow. They still don't quite know what's down in there. That's what the Lord said. If you can really measure the heavens, go out and tell me about all the different galaxies. How big are they and all the different stars and so forth. If you can tell me what's inside of the earth, then it's possible that I could cast off Israel. But no, I'm not going to. So where do we get the teaching that the church says, well, God's economy is now the church, not Israel, and he cast off Israel. Where do we get that? Where do we get that nonsense from? It's not from Jeremiah. Jeremiah says the opposite. This is the definition of the new covenant. Is this the new covenant that we teach to the world? No. We have a completely different definition. And it, we, this is all called covenant theology. There is no old covenant. There are seven covenants. God did not take the new covenant and replace the other covenants. It's added to and part of those other covenants. And there's still another covenant coming that will not replace the new covenant. This is fundamental. It, it, if you can grasp this concept, it completely transforms your thinking as to what is the reference material for me to learn the faith. All of a sudden, those prior instructions apply to you. And now you ask the question, how do I do that? Now you're learning. Now you're investigating. And now you're increasing in your faith. But if you stick with what the church has been saying, which, by the way, is a paradigm, a paradigm is a set way of thinking its conclusions. The present teaching of the church is a paradigm. It's not a theory. We're not investigating to learn it even more. We already have answered all these questions. You go to church, they tell you exactly this is the way it works. There's two covenants, that's the way it is. And by the way, Jesus came, did away with the law. Now we have the church, now we have all this new stuff that we do with the church. That's it. Don't need to ask those questions any further. That's all set and done. That's a paradigm. You know how hard it is when people are caught in a paradigm to break free from that? Well, that's what happens every time a Christian becomes messianic. They break out of the paradigm. And all of a sudden, they find out, wait a minute, the Lord said a lot of things that are different than what I was told. By the way, let me, let me say this. There is no churchman today, no Christian today, that made these decisions. We are all a product of decisions that were made by the church fathers going way back in the first and second century. There's a, a historical event that took place back there after the resurrection. It's called the Bar Kokhba Revolution. It happened in the middle of the second century. And that's when there was a big breach between the Jewish believers and the Gentile believers. The Gentile believers sided with Rome. The Jewish believers sided with Israel. And as a result, a lot of churchmen, Christians, said, we don't want anything to do with the Jews anymore. We don't want to have anything to do with them or Israel. We've got to change everything. And quite honestly, when Constantine came along and decided to make Christianity a state religion, that's when he said, hey, guys, if you're going to do this correctly, you've got to set up your own laws. That's when the New Testament became canon. Canon means church law. And so now the church follows canon. And they made a whole bunch of decisions about what we're going to do. Now, mind you, Christianity wasn't very successful with this because it all started off with the Greek Orthodox, and then it went to the Holy Roman Empire, and then we had the Reformation and the Protestant movement, and now that's busted into thousands of denominations. And then there's some Christians that say, I'm not having anything to do with that. I'm independent. 
they're all part of the same paradigm. They all have been caught up because of these decisions that were made a long time ago. So I don't have really a complaint against any of my fellow Christian brethren or any preachers or pastors or whatever. They were, they're all caught up in the same thing I used to be caught up in. Praise God. God, for some reason, through the Holy Spirit, and I guess I humbled myself enough to open my eyes, open my ears, open my heart, and let God speak to me as opposed to just repeating what I had been told. And so I went through the transition. And I found out that the Lord had a whole lot more to say than what I had been told. I can remember the day when I sat down. I used to be a good Baptist. In fact, I was a Baptist minister. I remember when I sat down with my fellow pastors and preachers I said, hey guys, I said, I, I gotta I gotta ask a question. We always teach everybody that we do what the Bible says. That's what we teach other people. We repeat that again and again. We tell them to uh, read their Bibles and do what the Bible says. Right? And everybody agreed. And I said, but here's the problem. We don't do what the Bible says. We have all kinds of excuses for why the Bible says this, why we don't do that. We, that, that. In fact, that's what we preach. We actually preach more about what not to do that the Bible says than what to do. Oh, don't keep Sabbath. Don't keep those Jewish holidays. Don't, don't do that stuff. You know, do, do this. So, do you understand how fundamentally wrong that is? Let me take you to the last words of Jeremiah's prophecy. Verse 38 through verse 40. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that the city shall be built to the Lord from the tower of Hananel until the gate of the corner. And the measuring line shall go further straight onward unto the hill of Garab, and shall turn about unto Goa. And the whole valley of the dead bodies and of the ashes, and all the fields unto the brook of Kidron, unto the corner of the horse gate toward the east, shall be holy unto the Lord. It shall not be plucked up nor thrown down any more forever. So what in the world does this description have to do with the new covenant? We're talking about Jerusalem that will be in the kingdom. When the Lord returns and the covenant, new covenant is still in effect, it, it says that the, we're going to be turning Jerusalem into a rebuilt place and it's going to be holy to the Lord. That's going to be the city of the king. That's where the Messiah will dwell uh, with us here on the earth. Now, there, I wanted you to take note of when it talks about the, the whole valley of the dead bodies and of the ashes and of all the fields under the brook of Kidron. To, on the east side of the old side of Jerusalem is the valley of Kidron. A, if you look down from the Golden Gate, uh, the eastern gate of Jerusalem, down to the, that, that brook, and then all the way up the Mount of Olives, it's a big cemetery. There's graves there. And it is viewed as an unclean area. And actually, the graves were started there because the Muslims heard that the Messiah was supposed to come through that gate. So they made the area, quote, unclean so that the Messiah wouldn't be able to go through there. The prophets are buried down there on the Mount of Olives and that area. The, the Lord says that he's going to clean all of that to where the, all of that will be holy. Now, one of the things that's going to help that is we're going to have the resurrection. And all those people in those graves, they're going to get resurrected. And so there's no need for a graveyard anymore. And it will not be plucked up. It will not be a waste place anymore. It will be a thriving place as a part of the city of Jerusalem. And the Lord says it's going to make it all holy. Um, and the, this new covenant goes all the way to the resurrection. It doesn't go away. It, it's going to be part of the new city of Jerusalem, even in the kingdom. It's not going to go away in the kingdom either. 
Uh, many of Christians think that the word new, when it's used in the word new covenant, new testament, it means it has replaced something. You know, we automatically think, well, if there's new, there must be an old thing. That's not the Hebrew meaning of the word new. That is a common thing of our culture, but that's not the biblical definition for it. Uh, we think a new item replaces an old item. We think that Christianity thinks that as a result of Christianity, that that has replaced Israel, the law of Moses, the whole temple system, all the customs of Moses. It's all been replaced. That is not true. Um, I have a lot of Christian brethren, friends of mine, been in the faith for a long time, and, and some of them have taken the position that they've replaced it so much that even though they are scholarly brethren, they admit to me freely they don't even read the Old Testament anymore. My gosh, you know, that's, that's three-fifths of the Bible, and they don't even read any of it anymore. Um, how can they say that they're scholarly and understand the Bible if that's not a part of their spiritual training? Let me give you the, the, the Hebrew definition for the word new. It can be found in the expression, the new moon. God doesn't come out into space and take the moon, which is in orbit around the earth, and cast it away and put a new rock out there. It's the same moon. It's just going through a new cycle. So we call it the new moon. I remember uh, specifically, and this will kind of date me, but I remember my grandmother and my mother uh, getting so excited about getting Tide soap. Uh, you remember soap operas? My grandmother loved those things. And she got Tide soap, and, and she loved the way it did the laundry, and it really cleaned the laundry up great. Well, guess what? Here she is loving Tide soap, and then Tide comes out with an ad advertisement that says, new and improved Tide soap. And pr lots of products will do this. My grandmother did not throw away that old Tide soap. It was still just as good as it was before. And the new Tide soap, I guess, had a new fragrance or something to it that was pleasant to the nose. But she continued to use that old soap right along with the new soap that she got because she knew they were there for the laundry and they still did the job uh, for it. We have the same thing with gasoline. Way back a long time ago, there was only regular gasoline. And then we, all of a sudden we got this new improved gasoline that was called ethyl. And, but that doesn't mean that regular gas doesn't work. It just, you know, you, you have two different gasolines. They both do the same job. We have scripture, multiple different types of scripture, and they all teach us the faith. They all teach us. None of it gets replaced by the others. The problem is that a lot of Christians think that if they go back to the teaching that is in the Old Testament, they think maybe they're going back to Judaism. And in fact, uh, we have heard the complaint of some Christians saying, well, when you get back into some of that, quote, Jewish stuff, you're being Judaized. Now, there is such a thing as being Judaized, and that's if you teach the teaching, the rabbinical Judaism, and if you also get involved with the Pharisaic teaching, that is Judaizing. That's the reason why Paul um, wrote the book of Galatians, the writer of Hebrews wrote it, it's trying to get the Gentiles not to listen to the Pharisaic teaching, stay with the Holy Spirit, stay with what the Messiah has done. It's the reason why the book of Hebrews is urging the Hebrew believers, stay with the Messiah, keep going with the new covenant, don't, don't get hung up with what the, the Pharisees have done in the past. Um, it's a real common thing uh, for us to struggle with this. Uh, but let me tell you, uh, from my perspective, Christians have fallen prey to the church fathers. They did not want to have anything to do with Israel, with the Jewish people, and so they decided to dismiss the holy writings of them and the teaching, the predominant teaching. And when they got the New Testament, they really jumped on it as belonging to them as opposed to the other belonging to Israel. That is not what God intended. Let me give you a simple definition of the Bible. The Bible is the Torah, the prophets, the other writings, the gospels, the letters, and the apocalypse. 
the prophetic books. Uh, there's really no dividing line in it. And in your Bible, you probably have a modern Bible, and in between the Gospels and what you call the Old Testament, you've got this one title page. And that one page says the New Testament. Uh, I don't have that page in my Bible, and the reason is because God did not write that page. That was never done by the apostles. The Messiah certainly didn't do that. Uh, that was put in there by the church fathers and Bible printers to separate and get you to go here, not there. Quite honestly, that page needs to be torn out of your Bible. The whole Bible is part of your instruction in the faith, and this idea of dismissing this part here, three-fifths of it, because it's called the Old Testament, is nonsense. It is air. We shouldn't do it. Messianics believe in the whole Bible, and so should you. That's our teaching for this Sabbath. We'll see you again next week with more Messianic teachings for Christians. Shalom, everyone. Thank you, folks, for viewing our broadcast here on the YouTube channel. I'd like to remind you, if you could hit that like or subscribe button for it, it's very helpful to our organization. And again, thank you for viewing our broadcast.